Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. Okay, well, um, welcome back to those who actually stayed behind. Um, let's uh, again, let's kneel for, for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you, Jehovah God, for the blessings that we have received thus far this Sabbath day. We ask that you continue to speak to us and you'll help us to be able to see your, your will in regards to this matter. Um, I ask that you give us your spirit so that we'll be able to understand and see clearly what it is that you have for us this afternoon. We thank you and we ask this in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. I'm going to ask you to bear with me um, during this presentation. And as you can see, the title of it is No New Organization. How many of you, by the show of hands, have actually read these words in the spirit of prophecy? Oh, a good hand uh, group of you. Um, some questions and concerns may arise after this presentation. If so, I will do my best to answer any of those questions or concerns. This presentation will challenge honest, sincere ones. What's important, important to this class of individuals is to know God's will and to follow it. We will begin by reading a famous Ellen White statement, one that is used by many to support an idea while at the same time dreaded by others. Well, let's look at this statement. And here it is. As the end draws near, and the work of giving the last warning to the world extends, it becomes more important for those who accept present truth to have a clear understanding of the nature and influence of the testimonies which God in his providence has linked with the work of the third angel's message from its very rise. rise. This is not the statement. I changed the chronolo chronological order of it, but it's after this one. Nevertheless, this statement is telling us that as the end draws near, we need to have, um, it's important for those who accept present truth to have a clear understanding of the nature and influence of the testimonies. And the reason, is, the reason is because of a lot, the majority of what we're going to present this afternoon has to do with the testimonies. So we need to have a clear understanding of the nature and influence of these. Now here's the, the, the statement. The Lord has declared that the history of the past shall be rehearsed. As we enter upon the closing work, every truth that he has given for these last days is to be proclaimed to the world. Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened. We cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. We cannot now enter into any new organization. For this would mean apostasy from the truth. What would it mean to apostatize from the truth? I'm going to give you one point of view. We cannot now enter into any new organization. For doing such would mean apostasy from the truth. In other words... From this point of view, we have to stick with the existing organization. 
because to begin a new organization would mean to apostatize from the truth, right? But let's read carefully, or let's read the statement over again. The Lord has declared that the history of the past shall be rehearsed. And what does that mean? It's going to be repeated, okay? As we enter upon the closing work, every truth that he has given for these last days is to be proclaimed to the world. Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened. Okay? So now we see that not only the past will repeat, but we are told that every truth has to be given to the world. And not only every truth, but every pillar. That's important. Every truth, every pillar. Here, in this statement, we've, it's a very interesting statement. But one that has not only intrigued many Seventh-day Adventists, but perplexed many of them. What is this statement saying, and what is it not saying? During this message, and, and I'm afraid it can linger, um, because there's a lot of information, but I believe it's very important. Because I also want to share some of my experience. I was two years, if I recall correctly, into the Adventist church. Very quickly, I became, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Acquainted with self-supporting ministries. Ministries that were considered by the organization or the church as offshoot ministries, independent atoms. So I have a background from my early years. As a matter of fact, two years after I came into the church, I became acquainted with such ministries. And many of these were afraid from what I could perceive of this statement. They were afraid to organize. Nevertheless, they were operating. Do you understand what I'm saying? There was also self, what you term self-supporting churches, which in my opinion, they're not self-supporting. Because the word self-supporting means just that. They support themselves. A lot of self-supporting ministries don't, do not support themselves. They have their followers supporting them. Okay? But of course, I had no clue when I just started. Most of these ministries were a blessing in my life. I learned a lot of truth from them. And I believe that God was using them to some extent. So let me continue on. Here's what the statement is actually saying. The Lord has declared that the history of the past shall be rehearsed as we enter upon the closing work. One. Two. Every truth that he has given for, the, for these last days is to be proclaimed to the world. Every truth. Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened. That means every pillar. Four. We cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. We cannot now enter into any new organization, for this would mean apostasy from the truth. What do we make out of this statement? That every truth and every pillar needs to stay alive so that we can proclaim it and teach it and share it. Right? To step off this foundation means to enter into a new organization. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, that's the whole context of this statement. As a matter of fact, if you read the whole entire thing, it's in, um, if I recall correctly, it's dealing with the alpha of apostasy. And so she says that we cannot now enter into any new organization because if we do so, 
this would result in apostasy from the truth. Here's a statement I'm not sure if I um, added, but it's in my notes here. So I'm going to go ahead and read it from my notes. Those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast. They are not remembering how they have received and heard. Those who try to bring in theories that will remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God or of Christ are working as blind men. They are seeking to bring in uncertainties and to set the people of God adrift without an anchor. Is the personality of God and of His Son Christ a pillar in the movement? Yes. And that pillar needs to be proclaimed to the world. If that pillar has been removed, then what does that mean? We stepped off the foundation. The Lord Jesus will always, will always have a chosen people to serve him. Amen. When the Jewish people rejected Christ, the Prince of Life, he took them from the, king, he took them the kingdom of God and gave it unto the Gentiles. God will continue to work on this principle with every branch of his work. Did you catch that? If we don't prove to be faithful, we will be, the work will be given to someone else. That's pretty much what this statement is saying. Organization. What's organization? Anyone know? Order. Something that's, you know, that works together, right? I am sure the Lord has wrought in the organization that has been perfected. And the fact that there are discouraging features in the work should not, be thought, should not be thought a sufficient reason for disorganization. Much light was given to us in reference to the organization of churches. And yet, we had a hard battle to fight in perfecting organization. But the victory was gained at last. And now shall the church be disorganized because of indifference, formality, and pride? Shall we go back to disorder because unconsecrated members of the church have placed upon the work the mold of man and sought to fashion the church to meet a popular standard? In other words, should we abandon ship because of these motives? Our indifference, formality, pride, and unconsecrated members working to fashion the church to meet the popular standard, a reason to disorganize the body? No. No. That's not a reason. Notice, it is nearly 40 years since organization was introduced among us as a people. I was one of the number who had an experience in establishing it from the first. I know of the difficulties that had to be met, the evils it was designed to correct, and I have watched its influence in connection with the growth of the cause. At an early stage in the work, God gave a special light upon this point, and this light, together with the lessons that experience has taught us, should be carefully considered. Notice, we see Ellen White who was involved in establishing organization from the very beginning. And one reason she pinned out, it was designed to correct evils. Did you catch that? God gave them special light upon this point. What point? Organization. So organization was it Man, did it originate with man? No. God organized these people. God was, all, was behind it all. As our members increased, it was evident that without some form of organization, there would be great confusion. 
and the work could not be carried forward successfully. To provide for the support of the ministry for carrying on the work in new fields, for the protecting both the church and the ministry from unworthy members, for holding church property, for the publication of the truth through the press, and for other objects, organization was what? Indispensable. Indispensable. It was needed. It was necessary. They had to organize. The list of things without organization, there would be great confusion, and the work could not be carried forward successfully. To provide for the support of the ministry, we read, for the carrying on the work in new fields, for protecting both the church and ministry from unworthy members, for holding church property, for the publication of truth through the press and other objects. Notice what she said the following year, in the year 1893. Take notice of the years, because I, 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 could, I could forget, but it's very important, the years that she penned this. 1893, she stated, we had a hard struggle in establishing organization notwithstanding that the Lord gave testimony after testimony upon this point. The opposition was strong, and it had to be met again and again. But we knew that the Lord God of Israel was leading us and guiding by his providence. We engage in the work of organization and mark prosperity attending this advanced movement. All this, all this was missionary work of the highest order, our work was not sustained by large gifts and legacies, for we have few wealthy men among us. What is the secret of our prosperity? She asks. We have moved under the order of the captain of our salvation. God has blessed our united efforts. In other words, their obedience. The truth has spread and flourished. Institutions have been multiplied. The mustard seed has grown to a great tree. The system of organization has proved a grand success. Systematic benevolence was entered into according to the Bible plan. The body has been complicated by the body has been complicated by that which every joint supplieth. As we have advanced, our system of organization has still proved effectual. Is this statement positive or negative? It's positive. And this is in 1893. 1903. Let none entertain the thought, however, that we can dispense or do away with organization. It has cost us much study and many prayers for wisdom that we know God has, has answered to erect this structure. It has been built up by his direction through much sacrifice and conflict. Let none of our brethren be so deceived as to attempt to tear it down, for you will thus bring a condition of things that you do not dream of. I'm going to stop there. I believe that that condition of things is happening right now. And that's my, my personal perception. In the name of the Lord, I declare to you that it is to stand, strengthen, establish, and settle. As at God's command, go forward. We advance when the difficulties to sur surmounted made the advance seem impossible. We know how much it has cost to work out God's plan in the past, which has made us as a people what we are. Then let everyone be exceedingly careful not to unsettle minds in regard to these things that God has ordained for our prosperity and success and advancing his cause. Were, those, were there individuals opposing organization in her day? Yes. We could expect the same today. So the beginnings from the perspective of a few of our pioneers. What did they have to say about the early days of Adventism in connection with organization? 
Well, first of all, they were expelled from the churches. And of course, we know that the second angel's message called them to come out. Abandon her, my people. Some were expelled and some voluntarily left in obedience to the command, come out of her, my people. And after that, well, where were they? They found themselves without a church, as to say. Here's a quote. Though we may not be all agreed as to what constitutes Babylon, we are agreed in the instant and final separation from all who oppose the doctrine of the coming and coming and kingdom of God at hand. We believe it to be the case of life and death. It is death to remain connected with those bodies that spake lightly of or oppose the coming of the Lord. It is life to come out from human tradition and stand upon the word of God and look daily for the appearing of the Lord. We therefore now say to all who are in any way entangled in the yoke of bondage, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. J.V. Himes, letter of August 29, 1844. So they believed that the teaching or the doctrine of the coming and kingdom of God was a teaching of life and death. They saw that this message was vital and to not only reject it, but oppose it or not even teach it in their houses of worship was reason enough to abandon these churches. But notice, of course, there was uh, not all everyone agreed that what constituted Babylon, according to this uh, J.V. Himes testimony. There was an agreement, an instant and final separation from all who opposed the doctrine of the coming and kingdom of God at hand. They believe this teaching to be a case of life and death. It is death to remain connected with those bodies that spoke lightly of or opposed the coming of the Lord. It is life to come out from human tradition and stand upon the word of God and look daily for the appearing of the Lord. And finally, the call of the loyal class to come out from among them and be ye separate. Can we, can we relate to that? We can relate to that. Remember the history of the past will be rehearsed? The course of the churches in cir cir circumscribing everything to just the tenor of their creeds led the mass of those who separated from them to look with disfavor on any form of organization. Isn't that the mental attitude of many today as well? Aren't we afraid of belonging to an organized structure? That was their fear, according to this testimony. As soon as they were, were expelled or came out of these churches, even some of their teachers favored such conclusions. The following from the pen of George Storrs, one of the earnest Advent laborers, will serve as a sample of that teaching, quoting, Take care that you do not seek to organize another church. Did you catch that? No church can be organized by man's invention, but when it becomes Babylon in the moment it is organized. The Lord organizes his own church by the strong bond of love. Stronger than that can be, cannot, be made, cannot be made, and with such bonds will not hold together the professed followers of Christ. They cease to be his followers and drop off from the body as a matter of course. In other words, what is this statement telling us? It's telling us it's sufficient for the Lord to bring his people together. There is no need to organize. Be careful that we don't organize into another church. That's what we read. 
right? It's the same sentiment today. And let me be more clearly, or more clear. There's accusations that are done by sincere individuals, honest people, I, I would say, that PHM is trying to start another organization, another denomination. And so, well, let me just leave it there. But by the end of this um, study, perhaps you'll have a clear view of what not PHM desires, but what God's will is. That's what's important. Not what I say, not what any man says, but what God says, as I said in the morning. An address signed by William Miller... Elon Galusha, W.N. Whiting, Apollos Hale, and J.B. Himes caution against the dangers or the danger of yielding to a spirit of revenge against the churches on account of their injustice toward us and, on, and of waging an indiscriminate warfare against all such organizations. That's good counsel for us, too. This advice was given a few weeks after Elder Storr's statement against any form of organization. It seemed designed of the Lord to hold the people from assuming to alter ground on the subject of church order and organization. Um, I put the page number there, but it's taken from John Lafro's book on organization. And if you have, I can give you the exact reference um, if you desire it. So here we see that, again, we see the same sentiment People concerned in organizing and becoming an organized or an organization. And in that same book, John Lofrow said, they were like sheep without a shepherd. It could be said of them as in olden time, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which is right in his own eyes. Isn't that what's, what's taking place today? I do whatever I feel is right in, in my eyes. And the other brother does the says or thinks the same thing. And is that helping the cause? No. It's not helping the cause. James White penned the following. After the time passed, there was great confusion. Is there confusion today? Yes, there's much confusion today. Some are even to the point where some get so discouraged that they want to abandon or just leave things alone because of such confusion and so much um, separations happening and taking, um, taking place um, among us. It's discouraging. After the time passed, there was great confusion, and the majority were stronger, strongly opposed to any organization, holding that it was inconsistent with the perfect liberty of the gospel. See, organization is only going to uh, incarcerate you, as to say. It only puts chains on you. Same sentiment we find today. Mrs. White was always opposed to every form of fanaticism, and early announced that some form of organization was necessary to prevent and correct confusion. Few at the present time can appreciate the firmness which was then required to maintain her position against the prevailing anarchy. The majority were against organization. There were only a few number of people who actually believed that it was God's will to organize. So I can imagine the, the stress that was involved in, the, in those men of old as they um, were experiencing these things. The writer, this is Loughborough, being privileged to hear the first angel's message in December of 1843, witnessed to some extent the conflict between the churches and the Adventists. And having united with the latter by baptism in the spring of 1849, 
has a distinct recollection of the situation among that people from the time of his association with them up to September 1852 when he heard the third angel's message and united with those of this faith. During the three and one half years of his connection with First Day Adventists, he preached the Advent doctrine. As a body, they were opposed to any form of church organization. No church records were kept, not even a list of members. If a person was sincere in his faith and was baptized, his name was considered enrolled in the Lamb's Book of Life. It being held that that record was enough. So, same, we're seeing the same, right? Different um, writers uh, pointing out their experience, what took place during that time. It can readily be seen that a people who had been trust, thrust out from organized bodies and place where each had to think and act for himself, and who had become accustomed to a sort of independence in thought and action would be in danger of confusion in labor under the third angel's message unless some system were established for the pr promotion of harmony of action. This is the object that was first presented and which has been kept in view as the different phases of the work have been developed. It is not a plan calculated to prevent people from searching for truth and seeking divine guidance for themselves, but is an arrangement which should promote unity among a multitude of thinkers. That's the reason we should be an organization, according to Loughborough not to restrain those who perhaps are tempted to think, well, my liberty is going to be taken away from me because that's the, that's the thought, that we're going to be giving away our liberties. But we know that in an army, your soldiers move together. True? Are we in an army? I mean, are we in, an, in a war? Yes. Are we an army? Yes. The Bible refers to us as soldiers, the Christian soldier. So we should be an army and we should move together. Is there a danger to move independently in a, in a war? Yes. yes, there is. Yes, there is. The laborers should consult together. No one is to strike out on his independent judgment and work according to his own mind, regardless of the counsel of those connected with him. If we think ourselves sufficient to manage the work of God and depend for success on our wisdom to plan and execute, we may expect defeats and losses, for, for they will surely come. So if we move independently, will we have su success? No. Knowing that it was a testimony they had prompted us as a people to act, to establish order, these opponents who turned their warfare against instruction from that source, claiming that when they got that gift out of the way, the message would go unrestrained to its loud cry. Are you getting that? The reason why the message hasn't reached the entire world or the entire globe, it's because of Ellen White or the gift of the spirit of prophecy. Once we get rid of that gift, the message is going to go to the world. That, that is what this is saying here. I find the same sentiment today, alive and well. In other words, what's, what's preventing the loud cry are these, are these ideas of organization. The following action was taken in 1853, just what, 10 years after the Great Disappointment, nine years. From 1853, the plan adopted was that of giving the ministers who had proved their gift and were evidently approved of the Lord and in harmony with all the work, a card recommending them to the fellowship of the Lord's people everywhere, simply stating 
as they were approved in the work of the gospel ministry. These cards were dated and signed by two of the leading ministers, known by our people to be leaders in the work. The ones given to the writer in January 1853 was signed in behalf of the church. James White, Joseph Bates, leading ministers. Who are these two ministers? Pioneers of the movement. And their numbers were small. So they took the role of leadership. God rose these men, not men. And would they remember the scenario I mentioned in the morning about me holding Bible studies at my home? And before you know it, there's quite a big crowd. Well, these ministers saw that the movement was growing. And so now they begin to see that they need to operate in an organized way. Of course, this is in 1853. The organization um, had just, it was starting to begin. Our people stood faithfully at their work, following the light that the Lord had given, leaving their opposers alone, and the result is seen as given in the Review and Herald of December 6, 1854, where Elder James White speaks of the situation as follows. Now, this is said by, by uh, J.N. Loughborough. Let's read James White's statement. There never has been such strong union as seems to exist with the remnant at the present time. And there seems to be general waking up of the work of God. The late scourge to which some refer to refer in this number, meaning the opposition party, will prove one of the greatest blessings to the cause. It will put the people of God under guard in their future course and free from them and free them from some who have been a burden to the cause and whom they could not reform. And so with the establishment of point number one in church order, we could see in one year the blessed fruit predicted in the union of the flock. What happened to those who oppose? Not only they disregarded the message, but opposed organization. They went their own separate ways. How many churches were born out of the Millerite movement? Does anyone know? A number of them. And the reason why they didn't continue, some abandoned their faith completely, but others went in a separate way, still teaching that Jesus would come, and they started to set different years. One, 1874. That was one year. And it was published in articles, and one man by the name of Charles Chase Russell read that article, he believed it, sold his business, and began a publishing business to publish that so-called message. You guys know who Charles Chase Russell is? The leader or the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses. So these messages sparked different movements. Are we seeing the same today? Are there different movements? Is God with all of them? Eighteen sixty-three, twenty nineteen. Where are we in this scenario? Where are we? In eighteen sixty-two, Sister White penned, "Unless the churches are so organized." that they can carry out and enforce order, they have nothing to hope for in the future. How much hope do we have? Did she say? If we don't do what? If we are not organized, how much hope? None. That was 1862. Angels work harmoniously. Perfect order characterizes all their movements. The more closely we imitate the harmony and order of the angelic hosts, the more successful will be the efforts of these heavenly agents in our behalf. If we see no necessity for harmonious action 
and are disorderly, undisciplined, and disorganized in our course of action, angels who are thoroughly organized and move in perfect order cannot work for us successfully. They turn away in grief, for they are not authorized to bless confusion, distraction, and disorganization. All who desire the cooperation of these heavenly messengers must work in unison with them. Those who have the unction from on high will, in all their efforts, encourage order, discipline, and union of action, and the angels of God can cooperate with them. But never, never will these heavenly messengers place their endorsement upon irregularity, disorganization, and disorder. All these evils are the result of Satan's efforts to weaken our forces, to destroy courage, and prevent successful action. How is this message going to um, reach its uh, climax with power, we are told, right? Do we need the assistance of the heavenly angels? Yes. But if we are disorganized, do we have their backing? No. That's clear. Otherwise, we're working in vain. We're working in vain. And we work in a disorganized fashion, we're working in vain. Men have fallen low. They are sunk in depths of sinful degradation. And it is because of lack of knowledge of the one of connection with vitalizing truth and because they are contaminated by the corrupting influence of error. In the work of saving men, men and angels are to work in harmony. Men and who? Again, if we don't work the way we are told to work, Angels will not work alongside us. And we read, they, the word never was repeated twice. Never, never will they um, bless such uh, a movement. Teaching the truth of God to those who are unlearned therein, in order that they may be set free from the bonds of sin, Truth alone can make men free. The liberty that comes through a knowledge of truth is to be proclaimed to every creature. Our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, and who else? And the angels of heaven are all interested in this grand and holy work. To man has been given the exalted privilege of revealing the divine character by unselfishly seeking to rescue man from the pit of ruin into which he has been plunged. Every human being who will submit to be enlightened by the Holy Spirit is to be used for the accomplishment of this divinely conceived purpose. Christ is the head of his church, and it will glorify him the more to have every portion of the church engage in the work for the salvation of souls. But the point of this sharing this statement, of course, is that angels and we as humans work together with them. Satan well knows that success can only attend order and harmonious action. He well knows that everything connected with heaven is in what? Perfect order. That subjection and thorough discipline mark the movements of the angelic host. It is a studied effort to lead professed Christians just as far from heaven's enragement as he can. Therefore, he deceives even the professed people of God and makes them believe that order and discipline are enemies to spirituality. That the only safety for them is to let each pursue his own course and to remain specially distinct from bodies of Christians who are united and are laboring to establish discipline, harmony of action. All the efforts made to establish order 
are considered dangerous, a restriction of rightful liberty, and hence are feared as popery. These deceived souls consider it a virtue to boast of their freedom to think and act independently. They will not take any man say so. They are amenable to no man. I was shown that it is Satan's special work to lead men to feel that it is in God's order for them to strike out for themselves and choose their own course independent of their brethren. Are we getting the picture? Are we endorsed to work independently outside of God's body? No. Well, who's God's body? Now, that's a good question. Where is God's body? Well, let's keep reading. Organization was designed to secure unity of action and as a protection from imposture. From imposture. It was never intended as a scourge to compel obedience, but rather for the protection of the people of God. Christ does not drive his people. He calls them. Christ never designed that human minds should be molded for heaven by the influence merely of other human minds. The head of every man is Christ. His part is to lead and to mold and to stamp his own image upon the heirs of eternal glory. However important organization may be for the protection of the church and to secure har harmony of action, it must not come to take the discipline from the hands of the master. Those who drafted the form of organization adopted by seven-day Adventists labor to incorporate into it, as far as possible, the simplicity of expression and form found, found in the New Testament. The more of the spirit of the gospel manifested and the more simple, the more efficient si the system. Organization is not a bad thing. What makes it bad is the corruption of it. That's what turns it or makes it bad. God has invested his, his church with special authority and power, which no one, no one can be justified in disregarding and despising. For so doing, he despises the voice of God. What year was this written in? 1875. We're going to see some changes. I am sure the Lord has wrought in the organization that has been perfected, and the fact that there are discouraging features in the work should not be a thought, a sufficient reason for disorganization. Much light was given to us in reference to the organization of churches, and yet we had a hard battle to fight in perfecting organization. But the victory was gained at last, and now shall the church be disorganized because of indifference, formality, and pride? Shall we go back to disorder because of unconsecrated members of the church? have placed upon the work the mold of man and sought to fashion the church to meet a popular standard. I read this earlier, and that is not a sufficient reason why we should disorganize. That's pretty much what the statement is saying. God has bestowed, bestowed the highest power under heaven upon what? That's a pretty powerful statement. His united people and church capacity, which is, which, which is to be respected. I'm sorry, it is the voice of God. Is that quote used today? It is. It is. I won't mention by whom, but it's used. But when was it written? In 1875. I mean, has the word of God become obsolete? It's no longer true? I believe it is still true. But, well, let us continue. I was confirmed in all I had stated in Minneapolis that a reformation must go to the churches. Reforms must be made, for spiritual weakness and blindness were upon the people who had been blessed with great light and precious opportunities and privileges. As reformers, they had come out of the denominational churches, but they now act a part similar to that which the churches acted. We hope that there would not be the necessity for another coming out. While we endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace, we will not with pen or voice cease to the protest against bigotry. 
If you read the whole context of this statement, it was in reference to the message of Wagner and Jones. It was being opposed. They were not allowing that message to come in. And she here says that we hope that there would not be the need or the necessity for another coming out. But when was this statement written? In 1888. Of those who boast of their light and yet fail to walk in it, Christ says, But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, seven-day Adventists who have had great light, which are exalted unto heaven in point of privilege, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. The reviewal in Herald, August 1, what year? 18. 93. So even though Alan White penned, we hope that there will be not a necessity of another coming out. So far, she's still in the church, right? Right? I know that the Lord loves his church. It is not to be disorganized or broken up into independent atoms. There is not the least consistency in this. There is not the least evidence that such a thing will be. The church is not to be what? And broken up into what? Independent atoms. Factions here and there. I was sharing um, during um, the meal time that the first time I came here, um, the little congregation that I was normally um, attending was at one point a, an independent church. And it's interesting because I started reading and trying to find Council on how to organize uh, brothers and sisters to do evangelizing work, house to house work, um, any kind of work to evangelize the community. And so when I began looking into the testimonies and reading, I read a lot on organization. And I was blown away by what I was reading. I was finding out so much to the point that I started to question if I was in the right church. Our church is an independent church. It's not an organized one. Well, some of the brothers there apparently were coming under the same conviction. And you know what happened? We went back to the conference. And so when we went back to the conference, I knew I was not too excited over that. My wife was in for sure. Um, but it was these quotes of an organization that led me in that direction. Because God is not, we've just read that the angels of God only endorse or work in harmony with an organized body. And so I made my decision. But when I did, I was not aware of the issue with the Trinity. I had no clue. So I began another journey. And this is where I'm at. But it's not over. And listen to, well, let's continue with our study. In other words, this statement is saying we're not supposed to split into groups. Different faction, independent atoms. That's how I understand this statement. In the context of everything that she wrote on organization. I tell you, my brethren, the Lord has an organized body through whom he will work. When anyone is drawing apart from the organized body of God's 
commandment-keeping people, when he begins to weight the church in his human scales and begins to pronounce judgment against them, then you may know that God is not leading him. He is on the wrong track. You catch that? If we depart or start waiting the organized body and leading contrary to that body, she's saying he is on the wrong track. Isn't that what the statement reads? Not only that, she says, I tell you, my brethren, the Lord has what? An organized body. When was this pen? 1893. Let me ask you. Were the foundation of beliefs the same in that year? Had any teachings changed? Were teachings coming in? Different teachings coming in? Yes. That I'll be careful not to make an outcry against the only people who are fulfilling the description given of the remnant people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. God has a distinct people, a church on earth, second to none, but superior to all their facilities to teach the truth, to vindicate the law of God. My brother, if you are teaching that the Seventh-day Adventist church is Babylon, you are what? Wrong. That's clear. When was this pen? Same year, 1893. The voice from Battle Creek, which has been regarded as authority in counseling how, how the work should be done, is no longer what? Do we see a change? Do we? Yes. It is no longer the voice of God. What year was this? 1896. It has been some years since I have considered the General Conference as the voice of God. It's been what? Some years. She no longer considers them the voice of God. The old pioneers we know were dying. And the ones that were left were, they didn't have as much influence as they did in the beginning of the work. A new generation of Seventh-day Adventists was arising. And I'm, every time I mention that, I always remember what I have read in the Hebrew Scriptures. A new generation who knew not, or who knew not Jehovah. They didn't know the true God. And I believe that was the case with this new generation of Adventists coming up. The church is in the Laodicean state. The presence of God is what? Not in her midst. When was that pin? 1898. Was she still a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? In 1898. Yes. Even though she pinned that, the, that God is not in her midst. She was still a member. Unless the church which is now being living with their own backsliding shall repent and become converted, she will eat of the fruit of her own doing until she shall abhor herself. When she resists the evil and chooses the good, when she seeks God with all humility and reaches her high calling in Christ, standing on the platform of eternal truth and by faith laying hold upon the attainments prepared for, for her, she will be healed. She will appear in her God-given simplicity and purity separate from earthly entanglements, showing that the truth has made her free indeed. Then... Her members will indeed be the chosen of God, his representatives. When was this written? 1903. Was there hope? Or is, there, is there hope in this, in this statement? Yes. But what are the requirements to humble ourselves, correct? Humility. And what else? Repent and to stand on the platform of eternal truth. Is that also a requirement? Yes. 
In a vision of the night, I was shown distinctly that these sentiments have been, over, have been looked upon by some as the grand truths that are to be brought in and made prominent at the present time. I was shown a platform embraced by solid timbers, the truths of the word of God. What's the platform? According to this one statement, the truths of God's word, that's the platform. Someone high in responsibility in the medical work was directing this man and that man to loosen the timber supporting this platform. Who's this medical man? Everyone knows. Then I heard a voice saying, where are the watchmen that ought to be standing on the walls of Zion? Are they asleep? Now notice the following word. This foundation was built by the master worker and will stand storm and tempest. Will they permit this man to present doctrines that deny the past experience of the people of God? The time has come to take decided action. So we see the word foundation. And we see also the truths of God's word. Do we not? And we, of course, we see her writing about someone in the medical work trying to tear these teachings or trying to bring them down, correct? As a people, we are to stand firm on the platform of eternal truth as we stood the test and trial. We are to hold to the sure pillars of our faith. The principles of truth that God has revealed to us are our only true what? Foundation. They have made us what we are. The lapse of time has not lessened their value. It is the constant effort of the enemy to remove these truths from their setting and to put in their place spurious theories. He will bring in everything that he possibly can to carry out his deceptive designs. But the Lord will raise up men of king perception who will give these truths their proper place in the plan of God. So here we see the principles of truth that God has revealed to us are, are our only true foundation. Everyone is familiar with this statement. This one was written in what year? 1904. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists. And that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. And engaging in a process of reorganization. Giving up the doctrines is entering a what? A new organization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Has that new organization been established, I ask? Yes. yes. It's camouflaged. It's turned. It's changed. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of the system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. So this new organization is in fact a new what? Movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand, and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. If this statement has come to a fulfillment, as I asked one of my
close friends. As I mentioned to him, or made reference to this statement, has this happened? And if it has happened, who then is the new organization? And he looked at me and he said, interesting. I need to study that. Because it's being alleged that we are starting a new organization. That's the accusation. But here we see a few points. In giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith, this would be an engagement of, or a process of reorganization. The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Have that, has that happened? Our religion would be changed. The religion, what the church is today was in no way what the church was when the, the pioneers were alive. It has changed in every facet, form, and everything. It operates different, differently. It, it's just, it's run differently. Not only has its doctrines changed, they worship another God. Everything has changed. Everything. The only thing that has not changed, unfortunately, is what? The name. But it's an entire different religion. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. Isn't that what they claim? That was a mistake. That was error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. Go to your local store, right? ABC store. Not that I'm bashing them, but it's a, it's a reality. It's a fact. Books of a new order. Compare those with the ones that were written during the time of Alan White. Completely different. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of the system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. This is one where I, 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 I really I can't grasp. There's people who understand these truths. And in all honesty, for those who might be watching, if, it's, if, if they get to watch this, it's an honest question. If the current denomination, the corporate denomination, is the new religion, the new movement, what Ellen White said, nothing will be able to stand in its way. It will continue to the end. Nothing will be able to deter it from its work. Then why should I support this new religion or this new movement? Why? It's not the faith of our fathers. It's not the faith that God once gave to his saints. And we must contend for that faith. So that's just my question. Sure, there's honest and sincere souls. I agree. But there's only one truth. And we are called to unite with that truth. We are not saved by the, the rug or the walls. We are saved by Christ by applying his truths and walking in his commandments. Truth is important. If it wasn't important, then we can meet any other day, right? The founders of the system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. I repeated that twice. I don't know why. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. And, of course, nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they will place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the word of God, on the truth, on the platform, on the sand, and storm and tempest, tempest would sweep away the structure. When was this penned? In 1904. Was Ellen White still a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Yes. When a church proves unfaithful to the word of the Lord, 
whatever their position may be, however high and sacred their calling, the Lord can no longer work with them. Others are then chosen to bear important responsibilities. But if these in turn do not purify their lives from every wrong action, if they do not establish pure and holy principles in all their borders, then the Lord will grievously afflict and humble them, and unless they repent, will remove them from the place and make them a reproach. When was that pen? A year before 1904, 1903. With all this said, Sister White penned the following. That which the Holy Spirit testified to as truth after the passing of the time. When was it after the passing of the time? 1844, the year, right? October 22nd, 1844. And our great disappointment is the solid foundation of truth. Pillars of truth were revealed, and we accepted the foundation principles that have made us what we are, Seventh-day Adventists, keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus. That was written in 1906. 1909. I meant to... Here's homework for you guys. Um, let me just back up. Because... It's important that I. Okay, no, I was. I'm, I'm right. Oops. 1909. This is what she penned in 1909. Even though we have what we have read so far, keep everything in mind what we have read, especially here in the last two three minutes. Some have advanced the thought that as we near the close of time, every child of God will act independently of any religious organization. I used to believe that. I used to believe that. I would see the condition of our church, and I said, we're just going to be like Jeremiah. Not, not necessarily Jeremiah. I'm, Jeremiah was in Israel, and he was a prophet in Israel, but I figured we're just going to be independents. Because we can't follow the organization. We can't submit to, to their authority. But I wasn't, aware, I wasn't aware of this statement. I lost it. Here it is. Some have advanced the thought that as we near the close of time, every child of God will act independently of any religious organization. But I have been instructed by the Lord that in this work, there is what? No such thing as every man's being independent. There is no such thing. So what do we do? You see the dilemma? Are you guys seeing it? The importance of organization? Statement after statement saying that, or telling us that God operates through an organized body, that the angels of God will only work in harmony and bless those who are working in an organized fashion. And that those who are working independently are actually not walking in accordance to God's will. Do we see that? And so the dilemma, what do we do now? If we see that God wants to operate and he's, he operates through an organized body, what do we do? That's the question. This was written in what year? What year did she die? There's a statement. And I was looking for it and I couldn't find it. But she was laying on her bed, or her deathbed. Are you familiar with that statement? And she says, after I'm laid to rest, many changes will come. She knew it. She saw it coming.
the Redeemer of this world of the world does not sanction, experience, and exercise in religious matters independent of his organized and acknowledged church. Is that clear? The Redeemer of the world does not sanction, experience, and exercise in religious matters independent of his organized and acknowledged church. He doesn't sanction that or sanction that activity. Many have an idea that they are responsible to Christ alone for their light and experience, independent of his recognized followers on earth. Do people believe that today? Yes. But in, in the history of the conversion of Saul, important principles are given us which we should ever bear in mind. He was brought directly into the presence of Christ. He was one whom Christ intended for a most important work, one who was to be a chosen vessel unto him. Yet, he did not personally impart to him the lessons of truth. This is Christ didn't personally impart, it, impart to Paul the, the lessons of truth. He arrested his course and convicted him, but when asked by him, what will thou have me to do? The Savior placed him in connection with his church and let, them, and let them direct him what to do. You catch that? Is that the order that is being followed today? No. Did you, are you seeing this? Who, who appeared to Paul? When he was uh, on his horse, Christ. And according to this statement, he connected the, him, connected Paul, with who? And the church instructed him in the truth. But some today, and I know this is going to be taken out of context perhaps, but some today believe that they are taught by Christ and that Christ leads them in an opposite direction. Well, then the Christ that Paul had or pointed him was a different Christ. But I, I will submit to you that the Christ that led Paul was a true Christ. See, what kind of information are we getting in our mind? And who's bringing that information into our mind? We need to question those things. And we need to see that our, that our thoughts are in line with what's revealed. If our thoughts are incorrect, then away with them. Right? And accept God's sayings instead. Notwithstanding the fact that Paul was personally taught by God, he had no strained ideas of individual responsibility. While looking to God for direct guidance, he was ever ready to recognize the authority vested in the body of believers united in church fellowship. As members of the church, this is interesting. This is very interesting. Notice, during the time after the, the wilderness, during the wilderness period, the 1260, notice what happened. As members of the Church of England, they were strongly attached to her forms of worship. But the Lord had presented before them, in his word, a higher standard. The Holy Spirit urged them to preach Christ and him crucified. The power of the highest attended their labors. Thousands were convicted and truly converted. It was what, she, does she say? It was necessary that these sheep be protected from ravenous wolves, ravening wolves. Wesley had no thought of forming a new denomination, but he organized them under what was called the Methodist Connection. What did he do? He organized them. Who was leading the reformers? Although they didn't receive, or they, um, 
All the light was giving them, but who was leading them? Here's, um, what do we do? That's the question. Did you understood the message? And what do we do? If we continue the way we are, or let me just speak from my experience. Let me share what would, what's on my mind. I told you I shared with you my experience of why I went back to the conference. And that's because of all these statements. I saw clearly that God did not endorse independent work outside of their organized body. I saw that for myself. So I made the decision to go back. But I was still reading. My reading has not stopped. Even until this day, I haven't stopped reading. The more you read, the more you find. So... I learned about the truth about God. I started sharing that with the brothers there at my local congregation. Before you knew it, I was not invited there. They might say I'm invited, but I'm not invited. Their message is different from mine. I believe different. And so I said to myself, now what? Now what? With all this information, what do I do now? And then I started coming over here. And I saw what the ministry was doing, PHM. And by that time, of course, it was, I think, fairly new. And I started sharing some of the truths that I had learned, you know, Daniel 11, the king of the north, some other um, lines of prophecy. And it was, people were willing to take a look. I don't know what were their thoughts in the beginning in regards to, you know, what were their, what was their goal? I have no idea even to this day, you know, what I'm referring to in the beginning. But I remember asking Dustin, how far are you guys willing to take this? And I know why I asked. And the reason why I asked is because of all this information. And so now... Even prior to this, I don't, um, I don't recall. Perhaps you guys have. I don't. I don't. Um, but you could correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't heard a presentation on organization. At least I, I haven't. But I knew how important it is. But I did see that organization. Um, is something that PHM has done to some extent. And that was um, encouraging to me, knowing how important organization is. It was encouraging to me. And all of a sudden, different ministries on Facebook started talking about organization. All of a sudden, organization, organization. And I'm I'm a person that doesn't believe in coincidence. So I just said, well, maybe there's something here. God wants to bring this light and shed this light upon his people. We need to finish the work. What do you say? And if you look back in history, you're going to notice at least two things come to my mind. Two events. That the point came where the message 
one was, was no longer given um, to those in-house. A time, a specific time came or a specific day came where it ceased and it went to another class. It happened with the Millerites and it happened right after Jesus left, right after the, the stoning of Stephen. The message was no longer given and a focal point or with all their strength and mission to the house of Israel, but it now went to the, to the nations. If history is to be rehearsed, this is a question I don't have an answer for. When are we going to turn our message and give it to the world? Because this is in-house. It's just a question. But I believe that is going to take place. It has to take place. It's a prophetic event. It has to happen. The Sunday law has to take place. It's a prophetic prediction. The Turk invading Jerusalem has to, te has to happen. It's, it's, it's a prediction. It's in the Bible. I believe that God's people need to move to carry these things out. That's my understanding. Will everybody be on board? Will everybody agree? No. Unfortunately, not everybody is going to agree. And people will continue in their own separate movements. But if it's in the Word of God and in the testimonies, then I want to do it. What do you say? So that's what we have before us. We, want the, we need the angels back. We need God's backing. Without the heavenly agencies, our work is nothing. It's nothing. We can work all day and all night, and we will get nowhere. Remember that God said in his word, it's only by my spirit. We need his spirit. And we have a host of angels waiting to cooperate with us. A host. Can you imagine that? Millions, millions, myriads of angels empowering us to finish this work. But they can't do it if we're not following instruction. So, I don't know if there's any questions, concerns, but I just wanted to kind of put away or, or try to make it clear that no, no one is trying to start a new organization. The new organization has already been started in 1980 Amen. when the foundations were moved. That's why Ellen White never left and died in the church. There was no reason to leave. But when the principles, the truths of God's word were discarded and our religion was changed and God himself was removed, then that new organization was born in 1980. So let's not believe that lie. We need to believe things on the basis of evidence of what the Bible and the testimony say. Amen. What do you say? Well, let's pray, and then we'll have a, a Q&A. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the instruction that we find in your word. We pray that you'll give us the courage to follow your will as the men of old. 
that we can belong to that class and we can follow in our master's footsteps. Please be with us as we continue, um, continue to be in our midst. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth Pioneer Health and Missions